So welcome everybody for the first, first sessions this afternoon on temporal planning. And in this session we have two papers and the first one will be on a temporal relaxed planning graph heuristic for planning with envelopes and Andrew will be the one who will give it. Talk. Okay, thank you. So it's probably the longest paper title in ICAP, so you try to get the entire paper into one sentence. Um, so it's after lunch. Why should you care about this instead of checking your email? So let's say we have a driver log problem. Everyone loves driver log. Our goal is to get the truck from location A to location D. So the driver has to board the truck, and they have to drive somewhere through this map, and these edge labels are durations. To make things a little bit more interesting, because this is temporal planning, we're going to have an action which limits the amount of time that our driver can actually work for. So when the driver's shift starts, we have this work action which adds this fact working at the start, and then it deletes it at the end. And this fact working is a condition which has to be true over all the actions involving that drive driver, so boarding the truck, driving the truck. And using some human intuition, you can see if you try and drive the top route, you're not going to have <coughs> enough time because that's going to take eight hours to get from A to B to D. You actually need to go the bottom route. The problem we have, though, if we're doing search and we have this incomplete plan, so, so far we have boarded the truck and driven from A to B, this work action hasn't ended yet. And this incomplete plan, it doesn't reach the goals, but it, but it is consistent, right? We, ha we haven't actually violated any constraints here. And if we use a relaxation heuristic, it will happily ignore this negative effect here to say in the future we're going to delete this fact working, and it will carry on searching and it will deem this problem to be solvable. So temporal planning in one slide, slightly more than one sentence, see if I can do it in one slide. So we're talking about PDDL durative actions where we split actions into a start and an end, and we separate the start and the end according to some duration, and we can say there are some constraints which need to hold between the start and the end. So if I talk about an overall condition or an invariant, that's what I'm talking about. To solve these problems, we can see it as an extension of the forwards planning we would do for classical planning problems. So we're finding a sequence of actions, but now they're the starts and ends of actions. They have to be logically sound, so we have to meet our preconditions with the effects of the actions we put in. But now, additionally, we have temporal constraints due to the durations of the actions and due to the orderings we have to put in to say this action has these preconditions, so it needs to come after the earlier actions which support those preconditions. So to check the temporal side of things, we use STNs, we love STNs in our work, and essentially you can package up the temporal constraints into an STN and it will tell you if you have respected your temporal constraints or not. A popular heuristic for temporal planning problems is, is a temporal relaxed planning graph heuristic, and it's a lot like a classical relaxed planning graph heuristic. But instead of the layers being essentially integer labeled 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, they are now labeled with timestamps. And we put the timestamps, uh, the, the timestamps are essentially boosted by the durations of an action. So if we start, an action at some layer t, then the end of the action is delayed until t plus the duration of the action. There's one extra thing we do. Instead of all the facts appearing in the first fact layer, they appear in a layer whose time is equal to the time at which they were achieved in the plan that reached the state mm -hmm. we're evaluating. So it's a temporally extended structure. If you have a time window, in which a fact is going to appear at the start and then disappear at the end, you can actually put that negative effect into the relaxed planning graph. So you can say at this specific layer, it represents the end of the time window in which we had access to this fact. If an action needs that precondition and it hasn't appeared by that layer, it can then never appear. So it's a piece of work I did with um, Kevin Tierney and some others in 2012. You can get nice results there if you have time windows or recurrent time windows. But what we're looking at here is delete effects attached to the ends of actions that have started but not yet finished. But let's return to this example. So we've applied some actions. We're going to give it to our relaxed planning graph heuristic, and we get something like this. So these are the facts we have in the state. So those are the times they were achieved. 
We can then drive from B to D, so that starts at time 4.11, so it's the time at which we got to B, to B, plus a small amount of separation, an epsilon separation between an effect and the precondition that used it. The duration of driving from B to D is 4, so the end of it appears at time 8.11, and then we've achieved the goal. In reality, that's nonsense, though, because the end of this work action would occur at some point when we were driving from B to D. But because it's a delete relaxation heuristic, it's going to ignore that negative effect, and it thinks the problem is solvable. So really what we're looking at, at in this work is can we actually get that delete effect into the planning graph and actually do a better job of providing heuristic guidance. So the proof that driving from B to D is not a reasonable thing to do lies in our STN. So this is an example STN for the, for the plan on the previous slide. It contains just a few of the actions we might want to put in the plan, but the important things are these temporal constraints. So the positive weighted edges are maximum separations, and the negative weighted edges are minimum separations. So the duration of the work action is 7, the duration of the drive action is 4, board is 0 0.1, and then we have some, some constraints that because board uses a fact that was added by work, it has to come after work, and because work is going to delete a fact but was a precondition of drive, we have an ordering constraint there. And if we were to put in the actions to drive from B to D, we would identify that we have a negative cycle. So we go across the top there, we have an edge of weight 7, and then you come back along the bottom and it's 8.1 and some change. So that's how you would identify that this state is inconsistent. But at the point when you're just looking at this state and you're just trying to call the heuristic, everything seems fine. What we do have, though, because it's a simple temporal network, because it has a graph representation, we can use an all-pairs shortest path algorithm to work out the maximum and minimum time that separates any pair of points. And we can say, well, we have these actions in the plan so far, and we have this future end action which hasn't occurred yet. What's the maximum amount of time that could pass between each of these actions and the end of this action? So this one's 6.9 because board takes 0.1 time units, so that eats up 0.1 of these seven time units that the work action lasts for, which leaves us with 6.9. This one's 2.9 because it was 0.1 and then 4. Let's take that away from 7, you get 2.9. So the, the STN solver will give us this information. And what we want to be able to do, and what I'm going to show you, essentially highlight how we do, is we can get this information into the heuristic. This is a bit of a spoiler, but this is what the, the output's going to be. So as we are expending our planning graph, instead of our layers just being annotated by a timestamp, they also have this additional information that says, at the point when you got the fact working, you were seven time units away from the fact working being deleted. When you got the fact driving, you had 6.9 time units to go. When you got the fact at B, you had 2.9 time units until that happens. And then you can propagate these figures throughout the planning graph until you get this useful thing here. So by the time you get to the end of driving from B to D, you have a negative amount of time until the fact working would have been deleted, which means actually that action couldn't have been applied because working was an overall condition that needed to be true throughout the action to drive from B to D. So the envelope form that I've shown you so far is, a, is what we call a simple envelope. We add a fact at the start of one action, we delete it at the end, and then we have some actions which need to go inside that because they use that as a precondition. We can also get indirect envelopes in this form where we add a fact at the start that allows us to trigger another action which has an end effect which is a precondition of a future action. There's a nice paper by um, Arthur Bittman and, and some others in EKI 2016 which looked specifically at this class of problem where you have causal loops. So these aren't challenging because of delete effects, they're challenging because we have this interdependency, we have this chain of causal links between the start and then the start and then an end and then back to the original end. You can get quite messy envelopes where you have a combination of these things going on. Um, Will Cushing had a paper about these in 2007. I point this out just to highlight that we're not actually doing 
specific analysis to identify specific forms of envelope in this work. All we are looking for is do we have a future action that has started so it's not yet finished and does it have negative effects at the end of the action and does it have preconditions at the end of the action. So we're just looking for that pattern. We don't really care what the exact structure is. We're just looking for these two things. So in general, what are we going to do? So we are evaluating a state using a relaxed planning graph heuristic, and we have the plan that reached that state, and we have the STN that goes with that plan. So for each step i in the plan, we're going to use the STN to find this maximum amount of separation between that step and the end of all currently executing actions. So in my example, I just have one of these. It's the work action. In theory, I could have several such actions. And the things I care about are how long it will be until a fact F is going to be deleted by one of these executing actions. So I'm going to record that as FT of F. So this is for a given step. I'm going to record that information. And also, how long do we have to actually satisfy the end preconditions of one of these executing actions? And I'm going to denote that as AE, so the action end of action A, for each action A which is executing in the state we are evaluating. And now to push these into the temporal relaxed planning graph, instead of labeling our layers with just a timestamp, we're going to label them with a tuple. So we need to define an ordering relationship. So it used to be visited in, in ascending order of timestamp. We now still visit in ascending order of timestamp, but then we put an arbitrary but consistent ordering on tie breaking between equal timestamp layers given what they have in FT and what they have in AE. So it's still an ordered expansion, it's still deterministic, uh, so we can carry on with the same principles that we use for building temporal relaxed planning graphs. So if a fact was achieved by a step I in the plan, then we're going to put that fact into a layer in the planning graph which is labelled with the tuple for that step. Slightly more involved is how you calculate the label on an action. If I just talk for, for the example, it might be slightly clearer. So to drive from B to D, we have three, we have three preconditions. The driver is working, the driver is in the truck, and the truck is at B. And the worst case amongst all of those for how long we have until this working fact is deleted is 2.9. So we can start this at 2.89, recalling that you have to leave a small amount of time between a fact becoming true and being able to use it for precondition. So that's to start epsilon values taken off there. One thing to note is if we find another achiever for one of these envelope facts in the planning graph, so if we find another way of adding the fact working, then we can actually reset the fact time of that to infinity. So essentially it switches off this, this, this pruning once we've actually found another way of getting this fact. We've got rid of that constraint of relying on this, this envelope which has started but not yet finished. One other thing we need to define is because the end of an action is separated by the start according to its duration, you increment the timestamp of layer and you decrement how long is left until facts are going to be deleted or you need to have reached the ends of actions. And then, pretty simply, if you want to use a fact as a precondition, if it's a start or end precondition, it has to have at least epsilon left on it. For an overall condition, you have to have at least the minimum duration of the action left on it. And then, I haven't talked as much about this, but if you need to achieve the preconditions on the end of an executing action, you, need to have an, a, you cannot have a negative amount of time left by the time it appears in the planning graph Otherwise, essentially, you've shown that it's taken too long to reach the preconditions of our actions, and it's a dead-end state. So now back to our example here. This should now make a little bit more sense. So we've got this label by taking the maximum across those and adding epsilon onto it. This is by adding the duration of drive from B to D on it, which was 4. So now that wouldn't appear. This would be recognized as being a dead-end state. The other option we had on our map, driving via C, well, that's fine. So we get to, to step C with 1.9 time units left. It takes this one time unit to drive from C to D, 
we've got some spare time left working, we can carry on expanding the planning graph and we can reach our goal. So this is only going to change anything if we have n negative effects or if we have n preconditions. Otherwise, it just does exactly as the pop of TRPG does. So it's not introducing any overheads when it doesn't actually matter. So to evaluate this, we used it with WA star search and all the domains we could find which had envelopes in them. And our baseline heuristic is an unmodified TRPG. And it's usually faster. So this is, this is a nice result there. And in particular, there's a lots of problems which didn't used to be solvable before at all. And we can now actually solve. There are some interesting cases where actually it's not faster. And what's happening here, so this is, this is the match domain, where we are providing better heuristic guidance, and then we actually look, we are expanding fewer nodes. But there are some overheads in propagating these, these, lay, these labels throughout the planning graph. So the extra time taken in the heuristic evaluation of each state isn't paying off in terms of the overall runtime of a planner. But if you have envelopes, and particularly if you have contended resources, so things like true operations or the shift of a driver, this gives you some nice results in terms of how well you can scale. Those are my conclusions. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. So um, can you also do this with the continuous effects? So we don't look at doing this with continuous effects yet. So um, this has been an unsolved problem for a few years, just in the propositional case. Um, so we started looking at that first. But if you know me, it won't surprise you to know that I'm now looking at pushing this into hybrid planning. Yeah. Can we have an example when you go from B to D, and then you find out that this last action is like that end? Yep. You actually could do it with the start action as well. Because you have the knowledge that there's two API remaining. Yes, so it's, yes, you're right. So it's actually that's just an implementation detail. Um, that when we come to trying to end the action, that's the point at which we check that the overall condition would have held for long enough. But yeah, you're, you're right. It would be equally. It would be an equivalent formulation. Any other questions? Um, so I have one. So you said that you <coughs> don't actively identify envelope, yes. but your technique would be able to identify the envelopes for the three cases that you give an example? For Not for all the possible so envelopes. For the first two, yes. And there's a PhD student at King's who's, who's looking at identifying envelopes and exploiting that. Um, for the third one, when you start piecing together, you know, it's the start of this action meets the end of that one and the start of the next one. <laughs> It's hard to find a piece of analysis which isn't quite brittle to the exact way in which you specify the domain. So as a first step, we just said, well, without analysis, can we identify something useful and exploit it? And I think we have. And did anybody do any research on all possible ways that envelope can occur? So, so, there was, so Will Cushing's paper from Educare 2007, it sort of sketched out the design patterns for envelopes, but then once you've sketched um, the basic components you can put them together in more or less, more or less arbitrarily many different ways. Mm, okay. Let's take together the speaker again. And Thank you.